everyone, uh, welcome to my channel, Vegan Below Zero, and today's video is going to be about a topic that I haven't covered yet on this channel, but it really, really interests me, and it's the concept of deep ecology. So you might not be familiar with what deep ecology is uh, as a philosophy, what it has to do with humans, animals, and how a fundamental belief in this philosophy would totally restructure our entire society. So deep ecology promotes the inherent worth of living and sentient beings on their own and outside of any context of utility uh, to humans and human needs. So before I dive into any more about deep ecology, let's talk about ecology as we know it. So the natural world is a diverse and intricate balance of interconnected relationships between pretty much all the species that we know, whether those are plants, animals, humans, everything works together and cannot exist without all the parts working together. So one really good video that I always recommend that is demonstrates this idea really well is the video How Wolves Change Rivers. I'm going to link to it above. So in this video, the introduction of wolves into Yellowstone National Park in 1999 actually changed the flows of rivers and the composition of forests through these trophic cascades. So watch the video if you want to find out how. It's really interesting. Ecology in the past was overwhelmingly focused on uh, anthropocentric environmentalism. So what that means is the focus of humans and how we use the natural resources that are around them as resources to us and how they benefit us. The concept of deep ecology in the 1970s really changed things, really was formed by all sorts of things that were starting in the 1960s. So the term originated from the Norwegian philosopher Arne Nies in 1973. So what he believed was that the way that we previously characterized the use of animals was based on whether or not they have an eternal soul, which automatically brings humans to the top of that uh, kind of chain because we believed that humans were the most worthy of eternal life or whether or not they have an, a use to us that allows us to justify um, causing suffering to them in order for us to eat their meat or you know, their beauty, the way that we like to admire certain animals but we don't necessarily appreciate the complexity of a type of moss versus a panda or something that has bigger conservation uh, money and funding. So deep ecology was really spurred by this movement, these philosophers that came out of this time, but as well with the field biologists determining that there was a complexity of systems and we were figuring out at the time how humans played a part within the overall ecology of a system. It really was popularized as well in uh, books such as The Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, which was a really influential book at that time. During this time as well, the organization Greenpeace was formed. Uh, we had things like the image of the earth floating in space that was bringing the idea of ecology to popular culture and overall creating this idea of environmentalism that we know today. So there's also astronauts such as Edgar D. Mitchell who saw the earth floating in space and he said what we needed to change the world and to solve the eco-crisis is a transformation of consciousness. So the principles of deep ecology. These principles come from the book Deep Ecology by Bill Duvall. So the principles are the well-being and flourishing of human and non-human life on earth has value in themselves. These values are independent of their usefulness of the non-human world for human purposes. Richness and diversity of life forms contributes to the realization of these values and are also values in themselves. Humans have no right to reduce the richness and diversity except to satisfy vital human needs. The flourishing of human life and cultures is compatible with a substantial decrease in the human population. The flourishing of non-human life requires such a decrease. Present human interference with the non-human world is excessive and the situation is rapidly worsening. Policies must therefore be changed. These policies affect basic economic, technological, and ideological structures. The resulting state of affairs will be deeply different from the present. The ideological change is mainly that of appreciating life quality, dwelling in situations of inherent value, rather than adhering to an increasingly higher standard of living. There will be a profound awareness of the difference between big and great. 
some other philosophers that, and scientists that discuss deep ecology and some of these ideas can be found in the books that I'm going to recommend here. One of them is Wild Children, Domesticated Dreams, Civilization, and the Birth of Education by anthropologist Leila Abdelrahim, who argues that the idea of human as the ultimate top predator, where all other animals fall under his control, will alienate humans from the community of life and justifies the destruction of wilderness, wildlife habitats, and animal lives. She says, the stories that we keep relaying both for entertainment and for education purposes in our scientific and fictional narratives are based on the premise that humans are predators, idealized and mythical figures of predation, thus informs our economic systems and our food consumption practices. Another good book to read is Deep Ecology by Bill Duvall, which I have already quoted in this video. So those are the overall principles behind deep ecology, but one of the parts that we can't leave out is the movement and the calls to action that these ideals produce. The biggest thing with the movement of deep ecology is restructuring human society in accordance with these ideas of deep ecology. Currently, the Earth is in a time of mass extinction based on humans primarily exerting dominion over other species and speciesism as a whole. Famous deep ecologists that have turned this into a movement is Dave Foreman, uh, who is the leader and founder of Earth First, a radical environmental advocacy group which was formed in southwest of the U.S. around 1979. This movement was inspired by books such as Rachel Carson's The Silent Spring as well as The Monkey Wrench Gang by Edward Abbey, and all of Edward Abbey's writings really helped bring about this group. Our role in the future, I think, is to try to preserve as many areas of natural diversity as possible, to try to make sure that there are some wolves and grizzlies and ponderosa pines and spotted owls and snail darters and what have you, so that when this human insanity runs its course, that there is life to come back and repopulate the world. And hopefully also to develop the ethics and the potential for a human society that can live in harmony with the rest of the planet after this industrial madness burns itself out. Earth First has caused many social ecologists, such as Murray Bookchin, to say that deep ecology is hateful towards humans. Since many deep ecologists are preaching population control, say that humans are a plague on the earth, there's also many deep ecologists that want to distance themselves from more radical groups that promote sabotage as a solution to these problems. Another really interesting movement that runs pretty parallel to deep ecology is ecofeminism. Ecofeminism says that assigning these patriarchal values of linearity, logic, to ecosystems that are complex, systems that are interconnected, is not the best way to go about things. I can make a whole nother video about ecofeminism, and I might actually do that because it's a really interesting concept. One of the ideas behind deep ecology is that uh, we base our discussion of animals and wildlife, plants, systems around their intelligence, and that's what we most value. But the problem with that is the way that we define intelligence is inherently human-centric. So we value things like reproducing, using tools, communication, where there's likely a lot of animal intelligence we don't even know yet. If you think about it, we think a dog is really intelligent because they know how to serve us and they know how to do things that are almost human-like. The way that we are able to use them is really beneficial, whether that's companionship or actually dogs having jobs. So we see them as really intelligent creatures. However, there's so many creatures out there that do not serve us as humans, but still have a level of intelligence that we don't even understand yet. When we're discussing animals and intelligence, it's a good idea to discuss the book Animal Liberation, A New Ethics for Our Treatment of Animals by Peter Singer. So what Peter Singer argues is that animals can suffer and they should have the ability to follow their interests, whether that's you know reproduction, thriving within their habitat, feeding, interacting with each other, or maybe some other interests that we don't even have an understanding of yet. And the idea of rights is not necessary in order to consider their suffering prior to harm them. So this book really popularized the term of speciesism, which is an idea that's really common in the animal rights movement. Speciesism is an idea that one species shouldn't be held above another, 
whether that's um, promoting the animal rights of dogs and cats, which we see as pets and very beneficial to us over the rights of cows, chickens, horses, some other animals that we may not value as highly. It's really just speciesism wants to put all species on a level playing field because they all feel suffering and they all have the right to live. But what about eating grass? Don't plants have feelings too? Don't plants have the right to live as much as all other animals? That's a really fair criticism of deep ecology. We need to consume products that have a negative impact on the earth, no matter how small. That's including our fruit and veggies consumption. And it's not realistic for people to just exist on fruit that is plucked from a tree without hurting it. So all we can do is reduce our consumption of those types of foods. If you really truly believe plants and animals have the exact same right to live, you're actually going to save more plants by just consuming the plants rather than consuming the animal that eats infinitely more plants than we eat. So overall, when you think a little bit too hard about this, it, uh, it's pretty depressing. <laughs> it's pretty sad to think that we as humans are causing so much devastation on the earth. So what can we actually do as human beings. So what changes even are these? I mean, many people know about many changes within the green movement you can make. I recommend that you go outside and you experience nature firsthand. See how the animals interact with the plants and how the ecosystem really is just all of these parts working together. That's gonna really help cement inspiration to help protect living beings and as well the habitats they work within. One way you can do this is to visit and support your national parks, whether it's state parks, provincial parks, city parks, um, anything that preserves that open space area. It's also through supporting political initiatives that protect the habitat of wildlife. Also choosing not to support industries that actively are destroying wildlife. Right now, one of the big things is reducing our consumption of plastic straws, but there's so much more that we do that hurts wildlife habitat, whether that's indirectly or directly that we can reduce if we really want to help wildlife. So a few examples of those industries is our dependence on oil, as well as animal agriculture, which is um, causing the destruction and land use change of forests all around the world. The fishing industry, where overfishing is causing a total change in the way our ocean ecosystems work by massively removing or destroying the fish habitat. You're watching rare video footage of a bottom trawler in action. Its heavy nets drag the sea floor. Shrimps, crabs, and fish are taken from the bottom and into the net. Meanwhile, most everything in its path gets crushed, buried, or exposed. The result? Destruction of the intricate mosaic of healthy sea life. Palm oil and the impact of palm oil on orangutan habitats. Suburban development, you can look at the sustainability of your own home and whether your home and your suburbs was built on previously sensitive habitat for wildlife and how pollutants are and certain chemicals are hurting bird species, large carnivore species. When we talk about reducing our consumption, that's something that's really popular right now with the zero waste movement. Unless you're going totally off the grid, uh, consumption in general is hurting our planet. So the best way to help the planet is by reducing your consumption. So unfortunately, there is some things that are not realistic to cut out. That's including our agricultural consumption, like our fruits and our veggies that come from pretty big farms. A lot of people don't have the option to buy all organic from local farms. So the best thing we can do is just to reduce the consumption of those things. So it's gonna have a proportional impact on less things needing to be taken from the environment. But what it really comes down to is if you believe that all animals outside of their human assigned values have the right to pursue their own interests, the best way that you can help is I'm gonna say it, a vegan diet. If everyone in the world ate a vegan diet, we could reverse climate change. We could stop it in its tracks. One person can save 100 animal lives a year. And if you have a true belief that animals have the capability of feeling suffering and that they have the right to exist as much as humans, also while knowing that the consumption of animal products is not necessary to live a healthy life, then there is no justification for it causing suffering and eating those animals. 
Animal agriculture and land use change for agriculture is the leading cause of wildlife species extinctions. So by reducing our dependence on meat, animal agriculture that causes deforestation, we are going to be helping endangered species along the way. As well as the environmental impact of reducing our meat consumption or completely eliminating it, ideally, is the massive health benefits that you actually get by reducing your consumption of animal foods. A really good book I'll recommend on that one is How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger. I am not a doctor and I'm not going to go too much into the details of the health effects that a vegan diet can have on your system because so many people have already made videos like that. So I'm just going to leave it to that book for now. Another good book I have to recommend on um, how we actually can make a difference on the environment is Coming Back to Life practices to reconnect our lives, our worlds by Joanna Macy. So that's what I have to say on the topic today. Basic introduction. Uh, if you are interested in seeing more videos like this, check out my channel, subscribe, like this video, share it with people who should hear this message. And um, I'll see you guys on the next video.